about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Hillebrand of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will say to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. I believe one of the key verses in this chapter is found in verse 34 where Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So he's calling his disciples to love one another in the same way that he has loved them. Now, most effective teachers are not necessarily great orators. Effective teaching really isn't about clever sayings or funny stories or word pictures or vocal inflections that tend to tug on the audience's heartstrings. By far the most effective teachers are those who demonstrate through the example of their own lives the truths that they teach. The greatest example, of course, is our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because here in chapter 13, again, he gives them this new commandment that was for them, is for us, the most important principle to govern our lives. Again, verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, Jesus didn't say this from some ivory ivory tower. He didn't preach this from some impressive pulpit. Jesus proved his love for us by dying on the cross, taking our place, our punishment that we should have received, Jesus took upon himself. And here in chapter 13, we also read that just before he gave this commandment, he also demonstrated how we are to love one another by becoming the humblest of servants. So let's read through, uh, starting at verse 1, and and then we'll go back and and examine it more closely. Verse 1, Now for the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing You do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed need only to wash his feet, 
but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you were not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a master is not greater than, or excuse me, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now again, in verses 1 through 11, we read about how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. In verses 1 through 3, Jesus knew that this particular Passover would be the one in which he would offer up himself on the cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look again at verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And, Simon, and, and supper being ended, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going to God. So Jesus knew that this was the last supper, the last Passover feast he would celebrate with his disciples. Notice again in verse 1 the phrase, he loved them to the end. What a great statement. What an awesome, comforting, wonderful statement. He loved them to the end. As we have noticed through our study of the Bible, Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He didn't make casual, flippant statements. He didn't make these boastful promises that he wasn't able to keep. You know, like some dating boys will do to try to convince their girlfriends of their great love. There was a, a, a pastor, J. Vernon McGee, who tells the story of a young man who wrote this, this letter to his girlfriend, said, I would climb every, any mountain, forge any stream, endure any hot, blistering deserts to, to, to be with you. I would do the most incredible feats to prove my love to you. And P.S., if it doesn't rain Thursday night, I might come over and see you. So <laughs> there's a, the great boastful thing, but yet not really the backbone to back it up. Jesus, however, backed up everything that he said. When he said he loved them to the end, he didn't just say it. He meant it and even did it. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And Jesus indeed did that. He gave his life to pay for our sins. In Romans chapter 5, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul tells us this, scarcely for a righteous man would one die. If you think about you and, and your list of people that you would be willing to die for, how long would that list really be? Probably not very long. Maybe immediate family, you would be willing to give up your life if it meant to spare theirs. But beyond that, how many people would be on that list? Scarcely, even for a righteous man. If, if you knew somebody was righteous, but yet they were no relation to you, would you die for them? Maybe, probably not. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might be willing to die for him. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did Jesus die for us? When we were good? No. When we got our lives squared away? No. When we stopped sinning those sins that constantly trip us up and entrap us? No. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In fact, before we were even born, Jesus died for us. That's the greatness of his love it not only covers our sins, but it crosses time and eternity 
And so while we, before we even were even born, before our parents were even born, Jesus died for us. And, and keep in mind, it, Jesus knew this was the last Passover. He was anguishing over his impending crucifixion. He was surrounded by 12 self-absorbed, power-hungry disciples. Also, he knew that one of them would do the dastardly deed of betraying him. But in the midst of all this, we read, Jesus loved them to the end. Now, I don't know about you, but this blesses me abundantly. It reminds me of the truth of Jesus' promise that he gave to us in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 5, where we read, He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? We, if you're anything like me, chances are from time to time you have wandered a bit, straight off. You haven't exactly been the super Christian you hoped you would be. You know, your, your, your long john underwear doesn't have SC on it, super Christian, you know. But yet, even though we might have wandered from time to time, or maybe even will wander from time to time, Jesus never leaves us nor forsakes us. Jesus loved them and you and me to the end. And he knew again this was the last Passover he would celebrate with his disciples. But Jesus knew all this. The disciples, however, were clueless. Do you know what the disciples were doing while Jesus was telling them these things? Laying these heavy teachings upon them, telling them that he was going to the cross and would die and would three days later be raised from the dead. You know what the topic of conversation was among the disciples? They were arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. Luke's gospel tells us there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. You know, kind of that Muhammad Ali attitude. I'm the greatest, you know. They're all bragging about one. Well, John was saying, well, in my gospel, I'm going to write about myself, the disciple whom Jesus loves, so I'll be the greatest. And Peter probably piped up and said, hey, Jesus said I receive direct revelation from the Father. I'm the greatest. And Nathaniel probably said, well, Jesus called me an Israelite in whom is no guile, therefore I'm the greatest. And of course, Judas said, hey, the Lord really trusts me. After all, I'm the treasurer. And we all know it's about the bottom line. And so who the Lord loves most, who, who the greatest one is, is the one who has the purse strings, right? And so they're all arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And as they're arguing, and no doubt in a heated discussion, what's Jesus doing? Well, the greatest of all silenced them through his servitude. Notice Jesus in verse 4 he rose from the supper. Again, picture in your mind, there's this table and people are lounging. up. They didn't have chairs and high tables back then. They had low tables and the food was spread out and they would, they would lay on these pillows. Usually their faces facing toward the table and their feet stretched out behind them. And they're all bickering and complaining. And, and as they're carrying on, Jesus just quietly gets up. And he lays aside his, his outer garments. Even by his physical appearance, he is now humbling himself. He, at this point, is looking like a servant, a slave. In fact, he begins to do that, which was the work of the most menial, the lowest of slaves. He took a towel, he girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and and then all of a sudden, as the disciples are facing the table and facing one another, arguing, one of them begins to feel some water being poured over his feet and being washed and scrubbed and then being dried. It says that he began to wash the disciples' feet and, and to then wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus here took upon himself the role of the most menial, the humblest of servants in our culture we tend to lose the meaning the original meaning of what foot washing really was all about today in church services or at camps usually foot washing is nothing more than a a quaint 
campy ceremony, usually accompanied by the singing of kumbaya, someone's washing feet, my Lord, kumbaya, you know. And it's usually just kind of a symbolic sort of a ceremony, but for the people back then, it was really a necessity. It was a gesture of goodwill. It was a much-needed courtesy given to a weary traveler. Back then, people walked everywhere. Not very many people rode on horses or donkeys. A few, especially the affluent, would, but most of the time, people walked. And they either walked barefoot or they walked on uh, on these or maybe with open-toed sandals and predominantly on on dirt roads. Wasn't a lot of cobblestone or pavement, no concrete or asphalt to speak of. And so they walked everywhere, and as a result, they, they got dirty, stinky feet. Now, if you were invited to somebody's house, the host would have his lowest servant stationed at the doorway with a bucket of water and a wash basin and a towel And they would wash your feet before you entered the house. It was a blessing to you, also a blessing for the host. You're not going to track in the world into his house. Now, this task required little skill. How difficult is it to wash somebody's feet? Little skill, if any. It was given to the lowest ranking servant. Here, Jesus, not only the greatest in the room, but the greatest in the universe, took upon himself the position of the lowest ranking servant. And no doubt as the disciples, as they're arguing, as they realized Jesus was now washing their feet, they no doubt began to feel a little sheepish about their argument over who was the greatest, especially Peter. Notice what he said in verse 6. And he, Jesus, came to Simon Peter. And Peter said, Lord, at least he got the Lord part right. In concept, in theory, he knew that Jesus was his Lord. But yet in practice, he fell a little short. Later on, he'll say, you'll never wash my feet. Here Jesus is saying, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter basically said, not so, Lord. Kind of reminds me of me. You know, oh, I love you, Jesus. You're my Lord. Okay, John, I want you to do this. But yeah, wait a second. I think it would be better. Wouldn't it be much better if? And and, and sometimes we, don't we? We argue with God. Try to change his mind. Try to pray to get God to do something differently than what we want him to do. Not content with the life that he's carved out for us, but yet we're going to do our own thing and insist in our own way? Peter said, you're going to wash my feet? Well, duh. Jesus is there with a bucket of water and a basin and a towel, and he's been washing everybody else's feet. And wait a second, what are you doing, Jesus? Lord, I don't know if I agree with this. Lord. (laughs) Jesus said, what I am doing, you do not understand now. And that's so much, so, so consistent with all of our lives, isn't it? We go through some hard things, don't we? We go through some strange things. What, and we wonder, Lord, are you really here? Are you really in this? Is this really you? Just remember what Jesus said to Peter. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. So basically, trust me. And surrender to my will. It's a great message. If we carry anything with us out of this place this morning, may it be that the Lord has called us to trust us or to trust him and to surrender to his will. But Peter wasn't ready to do that. Verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You're my Lord. I can't have you washing my feet. That's, That's a job of a slave. But Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Well, at this point, Peter really begins to backpedal. Simon Peter said, okay, well, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) Lord, if, if it means that you need to wash my feet for me to have a part with you, then why don't you just give me a whole bath? That'll be even better, won't it? You know, I admire his, his enthusiasm. 
you know, okay, if, if you need to wash me, then do the whole thing. But it wasn't necessary. Notice what Jesus said. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You're clean everywhere else, so now you just need a foot washing. And he says, and you were clean, but not all of you. What did he mean by that? The next verse tells us, he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. There was one who was unclean, one who had not come into faith with Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, later on revealed this to the disciples. And so one of them was not clean. No doubt the Lord had given Judas many opportunities. But he refused them. And therefore he sealed his fate. This phrase though, you're completely clean, but you only need to wash your feet. We become completely clean by embracing God's word. By receiving Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So Jesus spoke his word to them. The word that he was the only way unto salvation. They, the eleven of the twelve, believed him, embraced his word. Therefore, they were clean. But as believers, as clean believers in God's sight, sometimes as we walk through this world, we occasionally get our spiritual feet dirty by straying off the straight and narrow. Maybe we step into some worldly, fleshly dung pile that might be out there. Now we're all clean, but our feet at that point, oh, they're, they're pretty dirty. But at that point, we don't need to become born again again. We simply need Jesus to wash our feet. How does he do that? We read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're clean. But maybe this week you've stepped into the world a bit. Maybe you got some of it still clinging to your feet. What do you need to do? Do you need to become born again, again? No. All you need to do is come to Jesus for a spiritual foot cleansing by confessing your sin to him asking him to forgive you. And his promise is that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Then you'll be clean from head to toe. And if this morning you want somebody to pray with you, then after the service, by all means, come forward. There will be people here that would love to pray with you that you might together seek the Lord for full, complete cleansing. So, at this point, supper had ended. Jesus had washed his disciples' feet. They had no clue why he did it. So, in verses 12 through 17, Jesus explains why he washed their feet. Verse 12, When he had washed their feet, taken his garment, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. Jesus is Savior, Teacher, and Lord. He says, If I then, your Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, since there's no task beneath Jesus, there should be no task beneath any one of us. Since Jesus performed the most menial of tasks, we ought to do the same for one another. Notice in verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, and that, that's an interesting phrase, that most assuredly. The old King James Version says, verily, verily, which means of utmost importance. This is a truth beyond contradiction. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. So nobody should occupy a higher place than Jesus. And since Jesus occupied the lowest place, therefore we too are to occupy the lowest place. Since Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many, it is therefore contrary to the nature of Jesus for any pastor or minister, church worker, 
or any child of God whatsoever to adopt a serve me attitude. In other words, Jesus' people pull weeds. Jesus' people pick up trash. They sweep parking lots. They plunge toilets. They do this and all much more with a servant's heart of wanting to please their Lord and Master Jesus Christ and also to bless God's people. Now, we can talk about servanthood in a very theoretical way. And it sounds fine. We can talk about serving the Lord. And it sounds like a great, wonderful thing. But really, when you think about it, it it cuts against the grain. Our society has taught us. The world system teaches us that true happiness, true joy is not found through servanthood. It's found through getting others to serve you. It's the more people you have under you, the better things should be. You know, climbing the corporate ladder and the higher you go up, the more you have supporting you under you, having your agenda being put into place. And that's the goal of the world. Well, Jesus says just the opposite. He did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. This is contrary to everything the world in our society has taught us. And when we really consider this, it really does rub us the wrong way. Lord, I don't want to give up my own agenda. I don't want to give up my dreams. I don't want to call people to give up their dreams. Lord, I'm supposed to serve, to be like a slave. You know, a slave doesn't have dreams. A slave is only concerned about doing what his master or her master tells him to do. They have no dreams of their own. They have no agenda. Whatever their master says goes. You see, kind of cuts against the grain, doesn't it? Rubs us the wrong way. But isn't it fascinating how those who really adopt the godly mindset of servitude that Jesus calls them to adopt, those are the people that are the most happy. Those are the people who really get it, whose lives seem to be right. It's those who press their own agenda whose lives are really kind of a mess. Notice what Jesus said in verse 17. If you know these things, now we all know these things, but he says, blessed are you if you do them. It's one thing to know these things, but it's another thing to do these things. This calling us to servanthood is more than a concept. It's a commandment. And it's a way of life. But this commandment also carries with it a great promise. Those who make servanthood their practice are going to be blessed. Turn, if you keep your finger here, turn to the right of your Bible to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, picking up in verse 22. Notice what the Lord tells us about the blessings that are ours if we will do the word. As we're discussing this morning, particularly serving Jesus and serving one another. In James 1 verse 22 we read, But be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. It's possible to deceive oneself. We can come to Bible study. We hear the Bible taught and we think, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do, right? I've heard a Bible study. No. It's, it's paramount. Absolutely necessary that we not just hear the word, but that we go forth and do it. Because in verse 23 it says, If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Imagine that. You look in a mirror and you go away and you forget what type of person you are. You might think you're thinner than you are (laughs) and not realize. Or that you have more hair than you do and you don't realize. The Bible is a mirror. It reveals the condition of our hearts and souls, our lives before the Lord. 
But if we observe our lives and go our way, but don't implement the things that God tells us to do, then it's like a person who looks in a mirror and walks away and forgets who they are. But in verse 25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You want your life to be blessed? Do you want your life to matter? Do you want to have the peace that surpasses all understanding? Do you want to have the joy of the Lord? Do you want to really understand and experience what true happiness, peace, joy, and love is all about? Then do the word. Specifically, become a servant of Jesus Christ and serve one another. Now, this is a high calling that Jesus gives us, but again, he, he doesn't preach this from an ivory tower. It was very practical. He manifested the truth of this through his own personal life, specifically through dying on the cross for us. Jesus died so that we could be saved. He served us in the ultimate way, giving his life for us. We are called to follow his example and serve one another in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we read, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now again, conventional wisdom, worldly wisdom, tells us that true peace and happiness is found through pursuing and achieving one's own goals and desires. You know, one's dream, I, I'm going to, I hope to one day be this and do that. They, the world teaches us that the more money and the more stuff you have, the happier you're going to be. The more that you have people under you, the happier you're going to be. But the Bible tells us that pursuing pleasure, personal gain, is only going to stir up strife. You're there in James. Turn to chapter 4, verse 1. Notice what happens when people adopt that me first attitude, push my own agenda sort of attitude. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Where does strife come from? It comes from putting one's desires, one's own pleasure seeking ahead of other people. This is true not only in the geopolitical arena, but it's also true for the family. Let's try to make it very applicable here. Let's say in a family you have a, a husband, a wife, and the 2.3 kids or however many. And the father has his dreams. He has his goals. He has his hobbies. He has his agenda. And he has that attitude that if I can just do these things, achieve these things, then I know I'll be happy. <coughs> But at the same time, mom also has her agenda. She has her desires. If I can just achieve this in my career, if I can achieve that, if I can do this, if I can have these things, then I know I'll be happy. Same time, you've got a couple of teenagers. And their attitude is the same. I, if I can get this stuff, if I can have all these things and, and drive this thing, then I know I'll be happy. And everybody's seeking their own desires is there peace in the family or is there war in the family? In that scenario, what do you have, peace or war? We have war. You always have war. When people are seeking their own agenda, they're always going to have war. Now, let's say you have a different family, husband, wife, couple of kids. But the husband has developed the Jesus servant attitude. And he is living to bless his wife and to make sure that her needs are taken care of first. She also has developed the Jesus servant attitude. And she's living to bless her husband and make sure his needs are taken care of first. And their, their great desire is, is ultimately that they would do what's best for the kids. And they're serving their children by leading them in a relationship with Jesus Christ and making sure that, that what they're doing is for the benefit of the kids. And then the kids, let's say, miracle of miracles, they decide they want to serve their parents. 
And they really embraced the, the, the commandment that the Lord gave. Honor your father and mother that it will be well for you in the land of living. Yet the days on earth will be long for you. And they embrace that and they want to serve their parents. Now, now in that family, you're going to have war, you're going to have peace. Everybody's trying to serve one another. You're going to have peace. In fact, the only strife occurs when you're trying to decide where you want to go and eat tonight. You know, where do you want to? I don't know, where do you want to go? Well, you tell me. No, you tell me. That's where the only war comes from. When I want you to choose. No, I want you to choose. And, and what kind of a war is that? You know, McDonald's it is, I guess. I don't know. But trying to make everybody happy. So where do fights and wars come from? It comes from our own desires, our own pleasure-seeking. Desire for pleasure that wars. And putting our own agenda first. Again, this cuts against the natural order of things because we tend to think that the more people we have under us helping us implement our plan, the better we're going to be. But just the opposite is true. You will live life to the fullest when you completely and fully surrender to serve your risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to seek to serve his people as Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. No, you don't need to go to Colorado to find yourself. You don't need to go to some beautiful area of the country to find yourself. Your life is not found in any place. It's found by getting in your place which is serving Jesus in the example that he gave to us by serving us, washing the disciples' feet. If he was here, he would prove his love for us by serving us in the most menial of tasks. Nothing is beneath Jesus, therefore nothing is beneath us. And those who are in positions of teaching like myself or others, we should be the chief servants. If I'm doing my job right, then I should be doing everything at the church, around, I should be a chief servant. You should be a chief servant. In a church fellowship like we have, if everybody's seeking their own agenda, there's going to be strife, fighting. But if we all unite together to seek the Lord's agenda, surrendering up our dreams, our goals, our aspirations in order to implement the Lord's will for our lives, it's then that we're going to have peace. We're going to have joy. We're going to have love. The wars will stop. Striving will cease. And Jesus will be glorified. Later on, Jesus again said, this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. See, servanthood is all about loving. Loving the Lord, loving one another. Again, look at verse 34. The new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Not as I am telling you, but as I've shown you. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's the Lord's call. It cuts against the natural grain, goes against the natural order. But Jesus is right. This is the way to true peace, true contentment, true joy, not in serving oneself and putting one's desires above another, but to put the Lord's will first and foremost, serving Him and serving one another. May God direct our hearts to becoming his servants that we might truly experience the abundant life that God has called us to live. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for your example. Lord, it's, uh, these are hard sayings and we really consider how we're going to implement this call to servanthood in our own lives. It's, it's a hard thing. Lord, it's downright impossible apart from your spirit, that is. So right now, we pray, Holy Spirit, you would empower us to be able to, first of all, know these things. 
but then to experience the blessing of doing these things. Lord, it's not about physically washing people's feet. It's about serving one another. Lord, we do pray for for your fellowship here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett, that each one of us, each one of us who are the church, it's not this building, it's each one of us individually, we are the church, collectively we're your body. Lord, that we, your body, would serve you, serve you well, serve you without hesitation, without argument, without complaining or murmuring, to not be like Peter who objected to what you wanted to do for him, Lord, may we not object. We might not understand, Lord, there are things that are in our lives we don't understand. Why this? Why that? But Lord, you promised we would know eventually. And so we trust you. We surrender to you. We find our contentment in you. And we do pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the date of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m., Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.